Hello, everyone, and welcome to Forage Focus 2022. My name is Terry Noon, and I am the chair of the Ontario Forage Council. This is the third of three webinars in, for this year's virtual conference. Thank you to the Dairy Farmers of Ontario, Kemen, Berenberg USA, SGS Canada, and GoForages.ca for their generous partnership of this year's webinar series. Today's session is called Protecting Your Feed Supply from BT Resistant Corn Rootworm. Our presenters are Tracy Boddy, Ashley Napton, and Christine O'Reilly. Tracy grew up on a cash crop farm in Tilbury, Ontario, and has been the field crop entomologist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs for 22 years. Her recent areas of focus include research, research and extension work on BT resistance and management of western bean cut cutworm, corn rootworm, and dimethiote resistant spider mites. Tracy is the chair of the Canadian Corn Pest Coalition and co-chair of the Insect Surveillance Community of Practice under the Canadian Plant Health Council. She's a maritime pest monitoring network and co-administrator of the Corn Rootworm Trap Network. Ashley was born and raised on her family's dairy farm in the heart of the Ottawa Valley. She attended the University of Guelph where she earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture from the Ontario Agricultural College in 2013. Currently, Ashley acts as a Dairy Strategic Accounts Manager with Corteva AgriScience, working throughout Ontario and the Maritimes, while remaining actively, actively involved in her family's dairy farm, Napview Farms. Ashley was elected to the AAC Board in 2021 as one of two youth at large representatives. She is currently the Vice President of the Lanark Federation of Agriculture, the Secretary Treasurer of the Lanark County Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and a new Director on the Ottawa Valley Sea Growers Association Board. A graduate of the Gailey Foods Cooperative Leadership 2.0 program, Ashley recently earned her CCA accreditation and currently serves as a Director on the CCA Board. Christine O'Reilly is a forage and grazing specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agricultural Food and Rural, Rural Affairs. Her areas of focus include the benefits of forages and grazing within cropping systems, forage production, and grazing systems for Northern Ontario, and improving the productivity and profitability of forages. Christine joined the ministry in 2017 and is based at the Lindsay office. At this time, I would like to pass it over to our pre presenters. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for inviting us to speak. And I realize uh, no one really wants to hear about insects when you're a dairy producer, um, unless, of course, it's going to impact your dairy production. Um, and that's the case when it comes to rootworm. Um, so I want to uh, insist that this is a feed issue. And um, hopefully you will believe that too once we're um, done talking about this. Um, so rootworm has been a pest for a long time now, um, but it is, it's actually called the billion dollar beetle because it has such a significant impact in the US. Um, it is known as the most resilient plant pest and that's because it's been able to adapt to all management tools that we have. And that um, is part of the problem of, of why we're seeing the issue that we're seeing now. So there's two different species. There's Western corn rootworm, which is the yellow and black uh, striped beetle. And there's the Northern, which is kind of greenish. And to remember it, to think of, you go further North, you see lots of evergreens. Um, and so these two are, are spread across Ontario and um, especially uh, present in our continuous corn fields. I mentioned uh, corn rootworm is actually native to North America, started in Guatemala, came to the Great Plains region, early 20s, maybe 40s. But once monoculture corn started to happen, it spread quickly and it arrived here in Ontario around 1975. Um, with that came significant loss. And so you can see the lodging that it was um, what, taking place. Simply by rotating and ensuring that there wasn't corn on corn, we were able to have a significant impact on this pest. And it wasn't really until we started to see um, BT rootworm hybrids come on 
board again that uh, continuous corn production became the, the thing now in livestock production again, um, which is adding to this issue. Its life cycle, uh, it's a one year pest. So currently it is down in the ground in the soil as little eggs and it'll stay there until about June when the larvae hatch. If there's corn in that field, that larva thrive. They will clip these roots and cause root injury. And obviously you start to see those signs of goosenecking where the plant is actually trying its best to stand up uh, with those clipped roots. They pupate and around mid-July till the end of September, there are millions of beetles that are emerging out of that field, um, out of that soil. So any given day you may ha have hundreds of thousands, but they don't all come out at once. So they're busy mating and laying eggs in the soil. And of course, if a windstorm comes through that field, uh, then you see the significant lodging. Um, and then of course, obviously, uh, eggs are back in that field right now. And only if corn goes into that field next year will these larvae survive and continue that cycle. I mentioned it has adapted or resisted everything we've used on it. And that's really when we use the same management tool over and over and over again and don't rotate them. So in the States where this has uh, become a problem in at least 10, 15 years ago, they have been using soil insecticides, which now they are resistant to. They desperately tried to spray the adults, which is really not a recommended practice because again, hundreds of thousands of adults are coming out each day. Um, they're resistant to the foliars. They are now all resistant to all of our BT proteins that we have uh, on the market. And they've even adapted to the tight rotation of corn and soybeans that they have in the States where they've figured out a way to ensure that they're putting their their eggs in the fields where corn's gonna come back to um, the next year and survive. So really, it's this is a pest that we need to switch it up and change management tools repeatedly um, so that we don't have them adapt to what we're, we're throwing at them. Its impact, even though you may think it's an agronomic issue, it really has an impact on feed as well. So for every node that corn plant is clipped um, by these pests, you lose 15 to 18% yield loss. You also lose feed quality because obviously the nutri nutrients and water isn't getting up to the plant um, and the ear. You will also have the adults clip the silks, which can impact kernel development. And in situations for silage corn, when you have lodging, um, a lot of plants are left on the field because you simply can't pick it up for contamination risk. And so uh, there's multitudes of, of loss um, in especially a year when, like in Iowa, where they had a derosho go through and flatten most of their cornfields. And we suspect for uh, 1.5 of a root injury scale. So that would mean that one node, just one node is clipped back to about one and a half inches, um, you likely have resistance. And so we're seeing this throughout the fields in Ontario. Now the adults are mobile, they can move to other food sources. The larvae are stuck in place in the soil, they can only feed on root, corn roots, and if you don't give it to them, they don't survive. But adults can go and feed on other plants, and they do. They'll go to a squash, they go to soybeans, for example, to get a food source. But they can also clip um, or uh, take some of the tassels, and as I mentioned, clip the silk um, and significantly impact kernel development. And the bigger problem is that your resistant problem becomes your neighbor's problem too. So here's an example that happened a few years back in Blythe. We had a grower that had 50 year corn and he had clearly resistant adults or a rootworm. Those rootworm, because there's so many adults in a field, decided to move across the road to a first year corn field to also lay their eggs. The second year corn in 2020, um, it was there for that larva to survive. And so this neighbor uh, with a second year corn, silage corn, saw significant loss. He had over 50% yield loss and a lot of the plants were left on the um, soil surface because he simply couldn't pick them up. And the interesting part of this scenario is that the 
first original 2019 field and this field shared only one Bt protein in common, but those rootworm, root, root, sorry, those rootworms were able to resist both of those hybrids. So that means that there are three Bt proteins that they overcame in, in just two fields. And so this is, this is the problem that's playing out in, in a lot of the counties here in Ontario now, where your problem is reaching, uh, spreading to your neighbors and also causing them a headache too. Now this is the complication, and I realize no one likes me to talk about BT proteins, but they really are important to understand because they're their mode of actions. They're, they're very similar to herbicide chemical families. And so you need to understand if the pest can overcome one of them, um, they can do, overcome the whole group that belongs to that mode of action. And so here in Ontario, we have essentially four BT proteins, three of which are closely related cousins. They're, they've got the same mode of action, and those are the ones in red. On top of it, so again, there's only four BT proteins registered in Canada or North America. The ones um, italicized here are all resistant in North America. They've been known um, to have populations that are resistant. So that means that even if you try and switch to a different hybrid because you saw one have a problem, if that insect was exposed to one of the BT proteins, they're likely able to overcome the other. And so you might have a single trait hybrid at best, or both are compromised. Now, I know a lot of people want to come in and, and jump onto the RNA, oh, RNAi bandwagon. That is the only mode of action we have left that is currently working. So if you just simply switch to SmartStacks Pro, if they're already resistant to your two BT proteins that are in that hybrid, which they are, then you're leaving one mode of action to work against this rootworm. And history has taught us that in about two to three years time of a single mode of action, they develop resistance too. So if we lose the RNAi technology too, we're really in trouble because there really is no other transgenic products coming out that can save us um, against this pest. Now you are the first to see this. So we had 76 trap sites on the um, corn rootworm trap network this year in Ontario. Uh, and all of the sites that have anything yellow or red are those that have reached what we would call an economic threshold of two beetles per trap per day. So you can see there's quite a spread across Ontario now that have likely problematic fields that need to rotate out of BT corn into a different management tool or corn entirely, rotating out of corn um, to manage this pest because it is now becoming abundant and overcoming BT hybrids in, in much of the province. When you look more specifically at the um, data, we have about 57% of those sites having far past the threshold. Um, 28 of them being up to at least nine beetles per trap per day, 15 of them far exceeding that, and in fact, one reaching 32 beetles per trap per day. But I want to point out again, the, the range, we're talking from Chatham-Kent all the way to Hastings, and Durham being one of the worst uh, counties, and Huron, of course, um, that have highest beetle counts right now. So. When I try and lump and look, where is the real problems? These are the counties that for next year, that flags to me, they need a different um, option for rootworm management and mainly to rotate. So, and as Christine pointed out, eight, these are the top eight or nine out of 10 counties in Ontario that have dairy production or feedlots. And so this is, this is actually a direct, um, a direct problem for livestock production and in particular dairy production um, because of the corn on corn scenario. And um, I will also say, even though um, Stormont and, and Prescott, the Eastern counties are on low, there were only a couple of trap sites in those two counties. And when I look on the trap map, we have a pretty high site just just on the border of Quebec. So I, I'm concerned that those may be also a, a risk to us coming forward. So if you are in one of these red counties or border one of them, I strongly recommend that you 
use uh, traps next year. The traps are a benefit. Yes, it takes you into your field. You have to change them once a week for about four weeks. Six would be ideal. But it gets you to see what the rootworm activity is like in your field. It gets you more accustomed to, is this normal or is this high for, for this field? And as the case in a field I will show you shortly, it also gets you in the field to see any actual injury that's taking place and signs of resistance. So while you're looking, look for those signs of resistance and that will include higher than normal beetle activity. And that's where the trap network does come into play because it helps us identify those sites. But also if there's not already ears on the, the corn, you'll, start, you'll see significant leaf feeding. And that's usually a sign that there's a lot of beetles trying to look for some resources. The goosenecking, um, stunted plants, don't always assume that it's just because of drought. Stunted plants are usually an indication that something's happening at the roots level. Dig them up and take a look and see if there's some root clipping. And of course, if you see lodging after a windstorm, um, it, it's time for, in any of these scenarios, for both your seed provider and myself to be notified so we can go in and, and take and test those beetles and see if you are um, you have developed resistance, if it's a um, rootworm BT hybrid. And in case I haven't convinced you already in the importance of rotation, this is a site, a dairy field in Middlesex this year, significant beetle pressure, the ears were clipped, and the goosenecking was significant. They were lucky they had a few rain events that this crop survived. Um, but they did take a, a yield and quality loss and, and um, have an abundant amount of beetle pressure in the area. In comparison, this field is a first year corn field, clean ears, no beetles, and beautiful standing corn. So rotation can have a big impact. And in this field, he is a um, pork producer. His next year corn crop, knowing the, because we put uh, traps in that field. Um, he, there were zero adults this year, so there wasn't any um, eggs being laid, so he doesn't have to use a rootworm hybrid um, going into his second year crop. So that's a bonus too. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine, who's going to talk about how you might go about rotating that crop. Thank you, Tracy, for giving us some context on this pest. Um, we're fully aware that our audience today at Forage Focus is mostly farmers. And the reason that we're talking about this insect pest to you is because if I've learned anything working on this issue over the last two years, it's that only you care about your feed supply. Um, when we talk to the crop sector, they take a look at their business. They take a look at the proportion of acres they sell seed to that are in continuous corn for livestock feed, it's a pretty small amount. So they go, oh, that's a feed supply. The livestock folks will figure it out, not our problem. When we talk to nutritionists and feed reps and people who work on the livestock advice and input side of things, they go, we don't deal with hybrids, we deal with ingredients. We don't plan crop rotations, we don't grow the stuff. So that's a crop problem, crop sector can take care of it, Worst case scenario, we have to tell you, the farmer, that you're gonna have to pay more for feed if you can't grow corn, okay? So at the end of the day, the only person who gets hurt from lack of action from ag business is the farmer. And I know that you don't wanna be in the position where you have to walk into that barn and look at all those pairs of big brown eyes and say, I'm sorry, I got nothing. So here's the tough love, don't screw this up. How can you manage to make sure that you don't have the kinds of wrecks Tracy was showing us, those 50% or greater feed supply? Tracy has hinted at it. She's talked about it a bit already, but it comes down to crop rotation is a big one. So when those corn rootworms lay their eggs in a field, the larvae that hatch need corn roots to eat. If they don't have corn roots, they starve to death. If they have corn roots, they grow into adults and continue building that population. So if we can plant a crop in that field that is not corn, that has roots that those little larvae cannot eat, we can starve them to death and keep the population low 
and keep those below ground BT traits, that below ground protection that we do still have left, we can extend that. So it will keep working in the future if we use other tools in addition. So dicots are not hosts. That means all of our legumes, rootworm will starve to death. Brassicas and beets are some other things that they can't eat those roots. We also have some other grass species that just because of stage of maturity or some physiological things going on, rootworm will starve to death. They can't eat roots on things like winter cereals or sorghum. So we can use this knowledge to our advantage to figure out how to manage these crops so that we can still grow corn because we all know nothing feeds like corn. So your easiest option, especially if you are a dairy producer, a cow-calf operator, or a sheep producer, rotate your corn with alfalfa. Alfalfa is not a host crop, right? It's a legume, so we know that those roots are not what corn rootworm larvae need to eat. Um, it stays in the ground for between 9 to 12 cuts, so it's a really long break to make sure that we really can crash that population. They've got nothing to eat right there. Um, you can still put corn in that rotation. Like Tracy said, if you've got a field that does not have a history of corn, that population is low, that means when you do grow your silage corn or your high moisture corn, you can probably get away with a hybrid that doesn't have a below ground protection, doesn't have a below ground BT trait, the ones that work against rootworm. Um, another benefit is you get a nitrogen credit for that corn after your alfalfa. But best of all, and the reason this is the easiest option, is that your cost per acre and your cost per ton stay the same as normal. You're still growing the alfalfa and the corn that you need to feed. You're just planning a little bit differently where you're gonna put those things year after year. To kind of highlight how that planning piece works, I've got a very stripped down, very basic dairy ration for us to kind of use as an example. So in this ration, we've got some straw, corn silage, alfalfa haylage, high moisture corn, and a mineral supplement. If we go over to the very far right column, what percent of our ration is based on ingredients we're gonna grow at home? So we know that we can't grow our mineral supplement, that's purchased. I'm also, for the sake of simplicity, gonna say we're not gonna grow the straw. We're not feeding a whole lot of it, that's something you can probably purchase. So we're looking at just rotation of haylage and corn. So if we take just those ingredients and we know how much need to be in the ration, we know that we can't just say, okay, if I need 38% of my ration as corn silage, I need 38% of my acres as corn silage, because the yield potential of these crops is very different. Um, the other thing to factor in as well is our haylage will be split up with different age stands across the farm. So even though um, we're saying it's 38% of our ration in terms of the homegrown ingredients, um, we also have to factor in that probably a third of that will be first year, a third will be second, a third will be third year production. Um, and we also need to have some space on our farm for new seeding year as well. I have not included that as supplying the ration just to give us a bit of buffer and because the yield potential is so different. So when we take account these yield potentials and how much we need for our ration, you can work out approximately the percentage of your acres you would need to devote to each of these crops. Keep in mind, these yield potentials on the corn, both the silage and the high moisture, are assuming there's no rootworm damage. So there's no yield loss to rootworm. I can assume that because we're planning a good crop rotation. We're gonna put in our alfalfa for a few years and then go to corn and then go back to alfalfa. Um, but if you were doing continuous corn, those yield potentials would drop dramatically and you'd have to up the proportion of acres that you need in corn just to meet your feed needs. Because Ashley's favorite crop is alfalfa, I'm actually going to let her talk about some of the ways to maximize alfalfa yield and really make the most of a tight corn alfalfa rotation. Yeah, thanks, Christine. I think, you know, when I look at that last slide that you shared, we were looking at almost 50-50 of our acres being split between our alfalfa and our corn in that situation, right? So there's that opportunity to kind of keep that schedule uh, to three years per crop, in my opinion, because you don't count on three years of alfalfa, 
move it over to the corn for three years, then we're not risking overutilizing those traits and relying on them. And so, you know, for folks that are hesitant to kind of think about rotating, um, you know, putting alfalfa too far away from the barn, too far away from the silos, those kinds of things, there are folks who are going to be hesitant to really um, move that alfalfa too far away. They really want to keep that nice tight schedule, um, same crop close to the barn. Maybe we have the opportunity to really maximize our potential of the acres that we want to limit to our forages without, you know, reducing our yields. So having to steal other acres from elsewhere and without overusing these uh, traits to try and, you know, prevent uh, prevent this from being rendered useless, right? So I think the first step here and the purpose of this slide is to really highlight that um, we really want to maximize our productivity per acre. And so I, I kind of want to, you know, set the framework here that alfalfa is not a, a set it and forget it kind of crop, which I think sometimes it can be in our, our minds, right? It's so easy. You plant it and then boom, it's there every time you go to cut it. But are we doing everything we can to really maximize that production uh, to make sure we're getting everything we can out of that acre. So this is a great slide that um, Christine has pulled together to kind of show that, um, you know, we're cheaping out on those inputs, trying to save some costs there. Um, you know, it might benefit in the short term, but in the long term, that cost per ton really, really matters because we're not getting that absolute productivity. Uh, we have to drive over that acre every time, you know, three, three, four times a year to, to cut that hay. We might as well make sure that we're doing it for three ton to the acre rather than one, right? So really important to make sure that we are investing in this crop to really capitalize on that productivity. And I guess a bit of context on what the input cost is changing there. That number is fertility. And so the way that was calculated was just based on crop removal value. So if you have a lower yield potential, you can get away with a little less nutrients because you're not removing as much. Um, but you can see that even though it has a small decreasing effect on your cost per acre, it has a large increasing effect on your cost per ton because of that yield potential difference. And especially in years like like this year where crop prices are so high, we really want to make sure that every acre is, is earning its keep, right? So this would be the kind of year where we would look at some of those lower productivity alfalfa stands and say, you know, this could be making me a lot more money in beans or corn or whatever else we need to rotate to. So this is a good time to really be critical of the way that we're managing our alfalfa uh, or all of our forages to make sure that we're maximizing that, that potential. So if we flip to the next slide, we are going to see that uh, you know, here are kind of some of my key takeaways in terms of what we think would be the best practices that you can do to maximize that alfalfa yield. And none of these are groundbreaking. I don't have any like brand new information for you here, but we do skip over some of these sometimes. So it's worth kind of going back to the basics and making sure that we're uh, evaluating these. So we have start off there, you know, start off with a full stand. Uh, and I think that means both that establishment timing, I, we want to make sure that you're putting enough seed down uh, to really uh, have that stand be worthwhile for the full three, four years. Um, but we also want to make sure that you're checking that stand every single year to ensure that you're having a, a, a worthwhile number of stands per foot or stems per foot squared. Um, so plants are great. That's a good start, but it's really the stems that drive productivity. So we can in early in the season, go out and scout and have a good idea of um, how many plants are there, and we can kind of guess where we're supposed to be at. Uh, but really, as things start to green up, it's really worth checking in to make sure that we have those stems. And I put be critical of our age stands there, because sometimes when I suggest, you know, we should have a really tight three, four years, that alfalfa field should come right out. I get some pushback of, well, it's still really green. Like there's still hay there. Yeah, absolutely. It's still green. Is it enough to make it worth your gas? Is it enough to make it worth your time to drive over that field and capture that forage? And if not, let's pull it out and let's, you know, go ahead and have that plan to put it into a different forage or different crop. The other thing this is going to help us manage in some cases, I, I said I wasn't going to say the W word, but I changed my mind, is winter kill. You know, I would challenge some folks, and I know there's regions because I come from one where, you know, we are really good at killing alfalfa. But a lot of the times if we look at winter kill, I'm going to guess that it's probably on those older stands that have had more stresses. So if we keep that rotation tight, chances are we're going to reduce our, our risk of a really surprise winter kill situation, um, which is going to help us, you know, have a better handle on our forage supply the whole time. The next, oh, I'm going to point out the two graphics that are on there because they're pretty, they're both quite helpful. Um, the target plant count that I mentioned, you know, we can see where we want. You want over 20 plants per foot squared in that seeding year. You want to make sure that you have lots of um, seed down to make sure you get that, depending on whether you're broadcasting or uh, direct seeding. But then as you can see, you get to year three, those 
plants are so well established that they throw way, way more stems. So realistically, we want to get to the number of stems per foot squared, because then you don't have to worry about the number of plants. I would use the two of these numbers together, because uh, if you're in year three and you have two plants per foot squared, but 60 stems, if you lose one of those plants through the year, so you drive over it or it, the stem was dying off anyway, suddenly your yield potential is cut in half because you only had those two plants per foot square. So use those numbers together uh, to get an indicator of, of where that field productivity is going to be at. One of the other really big influences of um, you know, productivity is pests. Uh, potato leafhopper is a, a really great example. It sneaks up on us every year. And I mean, this is my job to look for it and it still sneaks up on me a little bit. Uh, the reality is, is that leafhopper can come in and do a ton of damage before we've had a chance to recognize it. And, and I'm not joking when I say a ton. It can, you know, we see yield damages of 50% as well as protein reduction really significantly. So if we want to maximize our yield for alfalfa, again, this is not a set, a set it and forget it crop. Get in there, start looking after that first thunderstorm, take a chance to see where those, uh, if those leafhoppers are there and manage accordingly. And then lastly, the last thing I kind of mentioned is you know, recognize and manage the growing season and environment. We know every crop is really impacted by um, growing season, but when we're looking at a balance of quality and yield, we have to change our mindset a little bit on harvest timing. So for example, if, if you're sitting in a droughty situation, we've had a, a distinct lack of rain, we know that our quality is going to be higher. We have changed the leaf to stem ratio. We have increased the digestibility. So is there an opportunity to delay our harvest timing a little bit to capture a little bit more yield, but still hit the quality metrics that you know, we need to, to feed the cattle. So understanding what those different growing environments do to the alfalfa is a good chance to make sure that we are uh, really getting everything we can out of this field for yield and quality. We can go to the next slide when you're ready, Christine. Beauty. And this is probably one of the most important. Uh, I think, you know, whenever you're taking a whole plant off of the field, boy, you're removing a ton of nutrients, right? So um, we have the egg sweet screen cap at the top there. And that's a great way of putting in your experience of this is how much my um, field is giving in terms of production. How much is my actual nutrient removal? Uh, the first thing uh, that I forgot to include in this slide, because before you even get to that egg suite, is absolutely uh, do a soil test, right? Do a soil test before you put that seed in. Get as much of that fertility correct at establishment as you can, because that's the easiest time to do it. Uh, but then recognize what that nutrient removal is year over year to make sure that uh, you're feeding that crop to continue to maintain that, that performance. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, the big three in terms of fertility. Obviously, we don't have to worry about nitrogen, but there's a big phosphorus and potassium. Also think about sulfur and boron. You know, there's ways to check if your uh, fields need those. Sulfur is pretty much a go-to. Boron is becoming new. It's interesting to keep an eye on. We can see deficiency in some drought situations. So have a chat with your, you know, fertility provider and, and see where you're at there. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, manure is a wonderful nutrient source. We know that, um, but we really rec need to recognize that it does not meet up perfectly with what the nutrient removal of alfalfa is, right? So ideally, I'd love for you to test your manure. I know that's a bit of an uphill battle. It's a tough sell, but if you could test your manure, that's the best thing. At least recognize what kind of manure you have and how it's going to, you know, support that crop. And then also really carefully manage that application. Go on as quick as you can after cuts if you're doing it in season. Uh, we don't want you to affect that regrowth coming along because that's going to affect your persistency down the road too, which means by year three, you know, maybe you don't have that productive field that, that we're hoping for. So those are kind of the big hits. Nothing groundbreaking, like I said, but to me, this is an opportunity to, yeah, shorten our alfalfa life cycle a little bit, but really capture everything we can per acre, as well as having a little bit better handle on our, our feed, our forage production, which is going to be our, our feed inventories. And I think the only thing I'll add to what Ashley has said is that in the last few years, there's been a shift in um, recommendations around how long you can keep an alfalfa stand. We used to talk about how many years you can keep it in, but now alfalfa breeders are really talking about the number of cuts over that crop's lifetime. So typically a healthy alfalfa stand can handle between nine and 12 cuts over its lifetime. Um, of course, if something adverse happens, if you're not managing pests, if you're not managing fertility, it's not necessarily gonna make it that long. But uh, nine to 12 cuts, I mean, depending on where you are, 
if you are in the deep southwest and on a dairy farm and you can sometimes squeeze five cuts into a year, that's a much shorter lifespan than if you are in eastern or northern Ontario on a beef operation and you're gunning for two cuts, right? So that changes how you might plan that crop rotation with your corn um, by understanding how much cutting stress that alfalfa can handle as well. All right, so some of you are like, cool, alfalfa corn, I got this. But I hear some of you going, but Christine, I can't rotate with my alfalfa. Maybe it's because you're a feedlot operator, you don't really grow it. Maybe there's something else happening on your farm that I don't know about that you're saying, uh-uh, that, that corn alfalfa rotation is not for me. I got gotcha. you. We've got another option for you. This is another one that kind of keeps your cost per acre and your cost per ton pretty well normal. And it's trading acres with a grain farmer who's nearby. The reason that this is a great option from a rootworm management perspective is because everybody's land gets a good crop rotation. So we're keeping that overall corn rootworm population very low. Um, it means that, you know, corn's never in the ground for more than one or two years in the same field. So again, that means we may not need those below ground protection, those hybrids with that BT rootworm trait, because there's not enough pressure to justify that from the, the corn rootworms. Uh, we know that soybeans and wheat make up the rest of the rotation on those grain farms. If you really want to get complicated and do some fun soil health building crop rotations, you could increase the complexity by moving the alfalfa around on both properties too. Um, but again, it's it's that same cost per acre, same cost per ton as normal because everybody's growing their same acres, they're just swapping land. This is easier said than done. <laughs> I will not deny that this depends so much on relationships with your neighbors. You know, is your neighbor someone you can work with? And with the amount of time we have today, we really can't go in depth on that. So I'm going to direct you to Mark Brock's 2019 Nuffield Scholar Project. It's called Farmer to Farmer Collaborations. You can either go on the Nuffield Scholar website and download the report and read it for yourself. Um, if you prefer a summary or you simply prefer a video, um, next Tuesday, there's going to be a recording of a webinar that was done last week that's going to be released on the Field Crop News YouTube channel. And Mark talks a lot about what he learned about how farmers work together, what makes a good partnership between two farmers trying to accomplish something. So I suggest you check that out if trading acres with a grain farming neighbor is a solution that appeals to you in terms of managing corn rootworm. But Christine, I hear some of you say, I can't or won't work with my neighbor, either personality conflict or maybe all of your neighbors are in the same boat you are and they're all livestock producers and they're all struggling with this crop rotation thing. We've got another option for you. Um, when we look at how corn rootworm populations grow over time, we've got a bit of opportunity to kind of stretch that rotation. It's not ideal because it does allow a lot of rootworms to, to build up in the landscape, but we can make it work in a pinch. So how this corn heavy rotation works, first year corn, you get a hybrid with no below ground protection, right? You don't need a BT trait that works against rootworm because the population of, of corn rootworms is pretty low. That's where you stick your traps out though, just like Tracy was telling us, so that you can tell second year, you probably don't need below ground protection in that hybrid again. The trap will tell you if something unexpected happened there, but generally you won't. Third year corn, we've been building that population for two years. This is where that crop's gonna struggle if it doesn't have a bit of help. So this is where that below ground protection, that BT rootworm trait really comes in to protect your corn from this pest. And the reason that we can still use it in this like once every four years scenario is because we're not hitting the rootworms with the same type of control two years running, right? We gotta keep them confused. We can't use the same thing twice because they're very smart and they will catch on. So we can use our below ground hybrids here. The following year, we go to a non-host crop. So if you're considering this rotation, I know you've already told me can't rotate with alfalfa. You've already told me can't work with a neighbor. So what are your non-host crop options? We know that this is your feed supply and we know that to take all of your acres out of corn at once makes no sense because you need the feed. So if you have 
100% of your acres in corn, or if this is just 100% of your corn acres. The first year getting into this four year rotation, plant a quarter of those acres into a non host crop. And I'll give you some options in a moment. Year two, you've got uh, your non host crop gets moved onto a different quarter of your acres, and you've got you know, some first year corn now as well. In year three, you know, you move your your break crop, your non-host crop again. So now you've got a quarter of those acres are not in corn, a quarter of them are in first year corn and a quarter are in second year corn. And then by year four, now you've got that four year rotation working that we just talked about, right? You've got first year corn, second year corn, third year corn, and a non-host crop. Options for that non-host crop. The first one is uh, a double cropping system that can yield as well as corn silage. So when you are coming out of that corn silage, right away after that silage comes off, you're putting in a winter cereal. Could be fall rye, could be winter triticale, uh, but that's gonna come off mid to late May. And then once the soils have warmed up above 12 degrees, sticking in a, probably sorghum sudan grass, but it could be a forged sorghum, could be a, a sudan grass and taking two cuts off of that. Um, neither of these grasses are hosts. So this is where we're crashing that corn rootworm population. We're helping manage that kind of pressure. Um, yield potential is pretty good. The downside is that neither of these have much starch. So they're lacking the energy that we need from that corn silage. That's gonna have to be replaced. The other challenge to just be aware of is that there are some allelopathy risks um, if you try to plant something after fall rye too soon, we can run into some issues there. The other one is if you jack the seeding rate up too high on the sorghum, we can run into some allelopathy issues on the next crop and, and have issues with establishment. So keep that in mind, but they are high yielding. What does it cost though? Um, it is more expensive than corn silage. And that comes down mostly to the number of passes we've got to do to harvest is, is basically where that cost is coming in because in general, our, seed, our input costs, seed fertility, uh, tend to be lower. So based on some calculations that some of us at OMAFRA have run, um, yeah, your cost per ton is going to be higher than corn silage. And because we're lacking that energy, you're losing close to $4,000 an acre in lost milk sales if you're a dairy producer. So that is probably an unacceptable hit, which means that you're now buying in about a ton and a half of cracked grain corn per acre to make up that energy deficit. So that $189.50 a ton, that's just the forage. Um, you got to add in your grain costs on top of that to make sure that you, you've still got the energy that you need in that ration. Okay, um, but Christine, I don't want to buy in grain corn. There is one crop that can rival corn in yield and energy. It's beets. Um, this is a weird one for us. This is not a crop that we tend to grow as feed or forage in Ontario, but it can grow here. Uh, why beets in this particular instance? It's a non-host crop, right? It's not a grass, so there's no way those rootworms can eat and, and survive on its roots. Um, the yield potential seems to be somewhere between uh, eight and a half and 16 tons of dry matter per hectare. Um, the main downside though is you need specialized equipment. So to get this crop off and put away, you need a topper and lifter. So to cut the leaves off the top and dig it up out of the ground, you also need a washer chopper so that we don't have rocks and soil and all kinds of things going into that silage. Um, beets can be sensitive to herbicides in other crops. So we really got to watch that crop rotation and make sure that we're not putting something down on the corn that might negatively impact the beets. Um, in a dairy ration, there are some limits there between 15 and 45% of the ration, uh, just based on production and, and some room and health stuff. However, those of you looking at this are more likely to be feeding beef cattle, finishing beef cattle rather than a dairy operation because our dairy guys have their alfalfa to rotate with. So we did plug uh, beets into a finishing ration, a ration designed for the last 100 days on feed. Um, basically, 
we swapped out that homegrown corn. So the corn silage and the high moisture corn, the stuff that's too wet to be purchased in, we swapped that out for beets and a little bit of alfalfa. Um, the alfalfa would actually be going in as dry hay because beets are really wet. So the idea is chopping some dry hay in to just suck up that water, take the moisture content down so it ferments nicely. And uh, I went with alfalfa rather than straw because beets are very low in protein. So just to jack that protein content up a little bit. And what we found when we were playing around with the ration software, there was no change in predicted cattle performance. So these steers are still expected to gain three pounds per head per day on this diet, whether it's based on beets or based on corn. Um, the main two differences were cost. Obviously the beets are more expensive because we got to get a whole new set of equipment. Um, and also moisture content. The, the beet-based diet was a lot wetter. So your, your dry matter intakes were comparable, but your as-fed um, feed was a lot different. Uh, we've hinted at the whole special equipment thing with the beets, and that's part of our um, differences in cost, although the, the operating costs of the equipment are not necessarily dramatically different from the operating costs of our corn silage equipment. Um, but the big chunk of change in that miscellaneous road there is actually purchasing the alfalfa hay to bring that moisture content down. And the reason I'm assuming you're purchasing it is because you've already told me you can't rotate with alfalfa because you don't grow it. So um, yeah, when we start looking at that cost per ton, I mean, the beets are coming in at 286, almost 287 bucks a ton which is a lot more expensive than silage corn, I know. Um, it is comparable to that double crop option. Like I know um, the numbers that I had up before, it was like 189 bucks a ton, but remember we still had to buy in the grain corn. So by the time you buy the grain corn in at uh, prices now, it's, it's probably going to be very similar in cost with that sugar beet option. So Ashley, how should we proceed from here? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I think the step one is to bring everyone to the table and make sure that we're all super clear of what our goals are, right? And so everyone listed here all has the same goal. And quite frankly, that's to help the producer succeed, right? The producer success is at the heart of what a lot of the suppliers are trying to do. So bringing everyone to the table is um, a great way to make sure that the lines of communication are open, you know, our goals are nice and clear. Um, and then at, that way we can, you know, all set our expectations without trying to overstep, right? So, you know, if, if I have my nutritionist tap on, you know, I say, this is how much starch I need. I need this much energy. I need this much uh, tons of forage overall. And then I switch over to my agronomist hat and I say, okay, let's talk about crop rotation and what kind of, you know, things we can do. And then the producer can step in and say, hey, this is what I learned at this webinar. We need to make sure that we consider this as well, right? And so then we can, you know, take all those puzzle pieces together and, and jumble them around as a team and make sure that that we're all succeeding. So um, I'm going to guess that the folks involved, chances are they're going to be willing to talk because, I mean, our success means that we get to stay on farm with you and that's when you succeed. So call up all these folks, bring them all to the table and then see what we can do to make sure that, you know, we get ahead of this problem quicker than we, uh, as quick as we can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I would say, you know, probably your advisors are not going to be the ones that initiate this conversation. So farmers, please set up this meeting because your advisors are probably willing to come to this meeting. They just don't, it's just not on their radar to take the step to set it up for you. So uh, bringing this up as part of the planning process this fall and winter is uh, something that hopefully you've got on your to-do list. All right, so before we open it up to your questions, just to, to hit on some things, this is a major feed supply issue. And because of you know different factors out in industry, farmers, you guys really need to be proactive because it is your feed supply that is at stake. Um, alfalfa corn really is the best rotation option on your own farm. And I think as you watch those costs go up, as we walk through some other scenarios, um, I hope that really you're, you're thinking about that one seriously because costs don't change. It's just a bit of extra planning. Um, if you can't rotate with alfalfa and corn, you know, land swapping with a neighbor can be a great way to get a good rotation on everybody's land base and keep those rootworm populations in check. 
Um, double cropping a winter cereal and a sorghum species yields well but lacks energy, so watch for that when you're planting rations. Sugar beets can do yield and energy, but they need special equipment. So uh, yeah, make sure that you are have thought through the whole sugar beet process before you commit to that one. Um, and yeah, just working with your advisors to create a plan because they are there to help you, but you've probably got to bring this up to them. All right. So with that, our contact information is up on screen if you've got further questions later, but we'd be happy to take some now. So, Christine, I'm just going to read this. So, Jason has a question there. So, how far will corn rootworm adults travel to find a new cornfield? So, that's a great question. Um, they tend to try and stay local, but uh, they can get carried, even like 40 kilometers if they need to in a windstorm. But unfortunately, in these high livestock um, production areas. They're happy because there's corn right next door. So they're just bopping around in these corn fields and continue to build up their populations. And part of the problem is because they're getting to such high levels, they are looking outwards to find more resources because the corn, there, there's just too many in one corn. There's a million per hectare um, that can be produced. So they need to move to find more resources and that's why it tends to be a neighbor's problem too. So Tracy, if I have a neighbor five clicks up the road has had this problem, that's that's a concern for me? Absolutely, and you guys should, I know not everyone talks to each other, but this is a neighborhood problem. And, and all of you are using these BT hybrids and they're very close related. So if your neighbor has a problem, you will likely have the problem very shortly. So you kinda gotta talk it out even in terms of because quite literally the the problem neighbor in Blythe that had the 2019 field that got contaminated his next door neighbor the next year he rotated out the soybeans but you could just see how that little tiny soybean field was left in a whole stand of corn like for mm. miles so it's good to try and kind of create a patchwork of rota rotated out of corn so that we start to see these areas have lower pressures because it's going to take a few years i won't lie we will still see them be okay and in, in especially the summers we've been having but over time you're going to start seeing the the overall levels finally drop and be much more manageable so i'll ask a question there and for for either one of the of the speakers is um you know, how significant, how important is it to, for our producers to realize that um, simply going corn and soybean isn't really a solution because of this uh, diapause issue? Yep. So that's a great question because we suspect we have a little bit of the, okay, it's complicated and I should, do I have time to share my screen? Probably not. Um, the northern corn rootworm, 30% of the population has the ability to have their eggs stay a second winter before they emerge as larvae. So if we get really strongly tied to corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, they thrive. Same with the rotation variant, which happens with the Western corn rootworm. Again, corn, soybeans, or even if it's corn and wheat, I know that's not a likely scenario, but if you're going one year on this crop, one year off, when they will figure it out. So I suggest if you, if like three years corn, one year off, or two years corn, two years off, but don't do every other year the same crop because they'll figure out a way to get around all that. I see a comment here. And um, so I assume that the calculations of corn based versus double crop diets or beet diets are using full yield on corn. So this is really towards Christine. Uh, if corn is at 50% yield, it would be good to see how the costs shift. Absolutely. So you're right. We did do those costs based on full yield. Um, we do have some information that uh, one of my colleagues, John Mollenheis, is a cost of production specialist. So he worked out kind of the, the break even point, how much yield you have to lose to make some of these options make more economic sense. And it could be a lot of them were kind of in that 20 to 30 percent yield loss range. Um, which is less than yield losses we've already seen in Ontario, right? We've seen greater than 50% yield losses. So yeah, the costs will shift, um, but just like our alfalfa yield scenario, where as yield potential dropped, cost per ton went up, 
same thing with corn. This is this is just how forages work, right? The equipment, the the cost per acre to run equipment hardly ever changes with yield. It's it's a very slight, you know, maybe your fuel and your wear and tear on your harvester is very slightly different, but that cost per ton is the big one. So definitely, if corn's half as half as much yield, you're going to have a much higher cost per ton, and that that's where um, some of those other factors come in too. Uh, just one more question there. I've been the, kind of the uh, the devil's advocate in this. Um, if nothing is done, we've seen the impact in the U.S. What is the likely impact here in Ontario? <laughs> they have been just having to tell growers, silage producers in particular, to just leave it, uh, harvest it as dry corn, and count, count it as a loss because they really have limited their ability to have any other tools. Because even rotation, unless we're fortunate here in Ontario, we have three crops in a lot of areas that help keep that pressure of that rotation variant down. But um, they really have messed up every single tool. And in some cases, they're trying to layer them on top of each other now, and it's still not working. So we are now in the scenario that the U.S. was in about two, three years into their problem. And I don't see us slowing down right now until we really take rotation seriously and limit our use of BT rootworm hybrids for that third year, that higher risk year. So I guess the question I would throw back is if you don't do anything and you decide I'm going to take that yield loss and just take it, where are you going to get the acres? Right. A lot of our livestock yeah. production is happening in counties where there's major competition for land. Can you outbid your grain farm and neighbor on acres to lose half the crop to still be able to feed the number of head you want to feed? Like the math just doesn't work. So uh, that's why the management is so important is to, to get a system in place so that you know you've got your feed. I know we're at one o'clock here. I'm just going to take this one question here from Jason is how big an issue is volunteer corn in a soybean field as far as providing a host for woodworms and contributing to BT resistance? That's an awesome question, Jason. <laughs> and I, I even drove by alfalfa fields this year that had volunteer corn. It is a problem because it is still a host for that rootworm population. So they're sustaining. Yeah, there's not as many plants for them to live off of, but they're living off of that. The second problem with volunteer corn carrying over is the BT titer, the, the level of dose in those volunteer corn are like a third of what they should be. So they're, they're even more easily able to survive and overcome the BT toxins because that volunteer corn is like diluted. So mm -hmm. it is a major problem. We have to manage the volunteer corn too. Or it's simply that field's not considered a rotation. Thanks for that question, Jason. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy, Ashley, and Christine for helping us get ahead of this important issue. That was some really excellent information and uh, really shows some of the value of where that alfalfa can fit in your rotation. Thanks again to our sponsors for their support on these webinars. And that wraps up our final of the three webinars for Forage Focus 2022. And I appreciate everyone uh, for participating, all our speakers, all our sponsors, and you, the participants, for viewing this information. We're happy to put this program and the quality together for everyone. Thanks again, and hope to see you next year and at some of our next Forage Council events.